Okay, Sasha, please start. Okay, thank you, Oleg, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to, to speak here today. So, as Oleg mentioned, I won't speak about SDP or linear programming or even optimization in general. Um, however, we speak about a different topic that turned out to be quite computation extensive. So, let's, let's see. Uh, so, today I will speak about space vectors forming rational angles. Uh, which is related to a question by, by John Horton Conway, who passed away this, this year, um, regretfully. So I think m most of the notions that I have in, in this talk, unless in the beginning, are really elementary. So space vectors are nothing but vectors in R3. And what rational angles means, well, an angle is rational if, if it makes a rational amount of degrees or if you measure angles and radians which mathematicians usually do we don't use degrees so often then a rational angle is just a rational multiple of pi or two pi depends on if you prefer half circles or full circles so this is a joint work with kiran kidlaya from the University of California, San Diego, Bjorn Poonen from MIT, and uh, Mike Rubinstein uh, from Canada, Waterloo. So if you don't, don't know what, where Waterloo is located, you can think about Toronto. It's near there. The, the main question today as at least as it appears in the work of, of Conway and Jones, because we shall we shall consider two different questions today, um, and we see, we we shall see that one of them is a subset of the other. So the main question, which is maybe the most pictorial one, the easiest to see, the easiest formulate, is to classify all tetrahedra, three-dimensional simplices, with rational angles, which means that we basically want to classify all six tuples of angles that describe a non-degenerate tetrahedron and such that uh, each entry is a rational multiple of y. So here you have a tetrahedron, has four vertices, one, two, three, four, and uh, there are six pairs of edges and six dihedral angles, alpha ij. So each alpha ij has to be a rational multiple of pi, and the whole tetrahedron that is defined by those dihedral angles has to be non-degenerate. So it has to be kind of full-dimensional tetrahedron, basically. This question is related to another question, which is more ancient. In, in a way, it goes back to Aristotle's. Um, but uh, let's start with some something more modern, like. Hilbert, for example. So it goes back to Hilbert's times. Uh, but actually, it's ancient already for us, but it also goes back to ancient Greece. Um, and the question is to classify all rectifiable tetrahedra. So those tetrahedra that are scissors congruent to a cube. So scissors congruence is the following. Um, well, this is not a very formal definition, but it pr pretty much gives you what you need to know. So two polytopes are scissors congruent. If you can cut one of them into a finite number of pieces, say tetrahedra, and then reassemble the other. So one obvious invariant of scissors congruence is the volume. So since we are cutting into a finite amount of pieces and reassembling things back, no Banach-Tarski paradox takes place, and so the volume is preserved. And uh, one of the questions is, all right, suppose I have a cube of unit volume, so unit side length, and then I have a regular tetrahedron, also of unit volume. 
Can I cut one of them into finitely many pieces and reassemble the other? Well, the volume here is the same, so you don't see an obvious contradiction. Uh, but are there any other independent invariants? Independent from volume, I mean, of this is congruence. And, uh, well, around, I think, 1901, soon after, Hilbert formulated the Cis's congruence problem for, for the regular tetrahedron in the, the cube. Max Dan, who was a student of Hilbert, very conveniently answered this question. So, uh, and uh, the, one of the main insights of, of Dan was that if you have a three-dimensional polytope, you actually can define an invariant that is an invariant of Cis's congruence and which is absolutely independent of the volume. And it has a very transcendental nature, very different from, from what the volume is. So roughly speaking, it measures the rationality between edge lengths and angles. But uh, frankly speaking, I still don't have a really good intuition that would tell you what that is. Um, well, the tensor product is already pretty scary. So if you look at this, you may realize because the tensor is, is over the rationals, that if your polytope has all rational angles, then the then invariant is zero. But the regular tetrahedron has a non-vanishing then invariant. So it, it is not Cis's congruent to a cube. And uh, there is a theorem, one direction is well, the then invariant basically. And uh, then it was proved by then, as soon as you have the definition, there isn't really nothing much to prove. And the converse was proved 60 years later by Siedler. And this is a very non-trivial proof. Well, then invariant uh, is also a non-trivial discovery. The, the proof that it is invariant is not so hard. It's an easy exercise, actually. But discovering it is hard. So the theorem says that two polytopes in R3 are this is congruent if and only if they have equal volumes and equal then invariants. So the then invariant of the cube, as I said, because cube is, is a polytope with rational angles, right? All angles are pi over two. The then invariant of a cube is always zero. So if you have a tetrahedron with rational angles, whose then invariant then is forced to, to vanish as well, the only thing that you have to do is to rescale those two guys to have the same volume and uh, then they, they are cis congruent. So such a tetrahedron that is cis congruent to a cube is called rectifiable because apparently cube is a pretty rectangular shape. And this is why Conway and Jones were in particular interested in such examples. So they were, they were looking at rectifiable tetrahedra. Um, we cannot so far come up with any idea how to classify all rectifiable tetrahedra, uh, but we can classify all the rational ones. And this seems like uh, already a, an interesting and actually challenging mathematical problem. So our main result, in fact, two main results, are the following. So the first one is exactly about rational tetrahedra. So there are two parametric families, two infinite families, parameterized by well, t, where t is supposed to, to be a rational multiple of pi. Um, and apart from these two parametric families, we have also 59 sporadic instances that come about on their own they do not belong to either of those families. And here you can see the list of sporadic instances. And well, it's a long list, 59 entries. And um, colored blue are those that were known before. 
actually this family here, the first family here, the first parametric family, was also known. It was discovered by Hill in 1895. Well, the second parametric family is new, surprisingly new, because those two families belong to, to the same orbit under the Regis symmetry. We will see, we will see what it is. So tetrahedra possess geometric symmetries, up to which we classify them, but they, they also have so-called Regis symmetries that come from quantum gravity. So those two families are Regis equivalent, but not geometrically equivalent. There is no, generally speaking, isometry that takes one representative of, of one family into the other, well, a generic representative. So here you can see that we also found not only new parametric family, we found also 44 new sporadic instances. This table is not so interesting to read, I think. So we have a more general statement, which basically implies, though not completely, not completely but in, in a way the same technique, let's say, that produces this more general statement, the same technique produces very quickly the list of rational tetrahedra. So up to geometric symmetries, meaning up to isometries, over three, there are only finitely many maximal rational line configuration, so configurations in R3. That is line configurations with all angles between the lines being in being multiples, rational multiples of pi. And uh, by maximality, I mean just maximality by inclusion. So there are finitely many maximal line configurations. Maximal means none of them is contained in a bigger one. And for the number of lines, you can see here. So if we, if we have three lines, then we have a single three parameter family, which is in a way trivial to handle because this single th three parameter family will be just, uh, you know, a, if, if you have a two dimensional sphere and you put a triangle on it, whose side length are rational multiples of pi, and then you make lines through the origin and the vertices of this triangle you exactly have uh, this family. Um, the more interesting things happen when n starts growing. Well, n equals four, you, you have quite a bit of families. You have 228 spreadic ones, 10 one parameter families, and two two parameter families. I'm not listing them here. You can find it in our preprint on the archive. Uh, but it's, well, already a long list. In dimension five, you have 29 spreadics and two one parameter families, so a little bit less. In dimension six, uh, you have somehow, well, sorry, in dimension six, but for, for six line configurations, you have 22 spreadic and five one parameter family. For eight line configurations, somehow you have only five sporadic instances and for dimensions uh, for, for, for sorry for for cardinality 9 and 15 you have only one so those are the all possible those are the only possible three-dimensional line configurations with rational angles between all lines and so when you have three lines the picture is pretty geometrically intuitive and simple and when you have four five or six lines the picture is pretty well pretty nasty in a way because uh, because you have to deal with uh, many sporadics many one parameter family families and two parameter families and when the cardinality is five and six the number of configurations reduces and uh, very soon 
when you reach, well, 15, 15 lines, it's not, not big configuration, you have only one maximal configuration. So every line configuration with rational angles, if you require big enough amount of lines, like 9, 15, is contained in just one single configuration. But even more surprisingly, if you have, if you have 16 or more lines, the only configuration you can get is this one, the perpendicular one. In order to preserve maximality, we require this one to be infinite. And I think you can easily see, more or less, and if it's not infinite, then might not be maximal. But if it is infinite, it's easy to prove that it has to be maximal. The other two remarkable ones are the rational line configuration with 15 lines, which is given by the icosidodecahedron. And with nine lines is another interesting configuration, which is given by the B3 root system. Now, these are the pictures. Now, let me get back to some mathematical facts that, that stay somehow behind all this theory. So, there is one interesting symmetry of tetrahedra, apart from, from their geometric symmetries, and we know that regular tetrahedron has just the S4 symmetry group. A, a non-degenerate tetrahedron has a so-called Regge involution. Now, this is a theorem that was discovered by basically theoretical physicist Ponsano and Regge in, uh, in the 60s, that uh, if you have a non-degenerate There is something interesting in the chat, but it's not really addressed to me. Um, if you have a non-degenerate tetrahedron, then it, it has a regge or Panzano regge image with different dihedral angles, which is going to be also a non-degenerate tetrahedron. And moreover, um, this regge involution preserves the volume and the denigre. And the whole Regge group of symmetries is just a symmetric group that is enhanced by the Regge involution. It is a finite group of order 144. So let's look what Regge symmetry can do for us. Well, if we take the first family of tetrahedra from our theorem that I said was discovered actually not by us, but by Hill, in 1895, uh, the Regis symmetry, the Regis involution, produces for us the second one. And we know if the first one is a non-degenerate tetrahedron, or there are a family of non-degenerate tetrahedra, then the other one is a family of non-degenerate tetrahedra as well. So in order to discover the second family, we don't have to do much. We just have to use this non-geometric symmetry. Um, moreover, the entries in our table of sporadic tetrahedra, if we go back here, you see, they are grouped not only by the denominator, but they are also, well, by the denominator, they, they are kind of grouped, but very loosely. Um, they are grouped, first of all, by their geometric symmetries, so each of those six tuples of angles corresponds to just one um, isometry representative of all possible S4, or all, all possible members of the S4 orbit. Um, but if you have two cells merged, like here, 30, 60, well, for 30 you have two tetrahedra up to isometry, for denominator 60, you have four tetrahedra up to isometry, but all six of them sit in the same regge orbit. 
So they, they are grouped also by their range of words. And as you can see, it's easier to study range orbit representatives because you have way less entries here, right? So you have not so many rows in this table, definitely not 59. Uh, for line configurations, because we can also negate individual vectors, we will use even a bigger group. And the biggest finite group that we used in our computation, final proof, is WD6 of order 23,040. I think the best, the best group to do computations is WD40. Then your proofs become extremely smooth. So our proof is computer aided. As you see, I mean, we have uh, we have a really good company, uh, such as the four color theorem, Kepler's conjecture, Oleg's proof of well of the 24, well, 24 Kisson number in dimension four. Um, here, I, I don't really claim the significance category, I only claim the methods of proof category. So we are in a good company, but probably we take a, a lower place, you know. So let me give you an outline of our proof and uh, basically indicate where the proof is theoretical and where the proof gets heavily computational. So first, we want to find all the rational four-line configurations. So some of those four-line configurations will right away give the rational tetrahedra because if you have a rational tetrahedron and you draw the lines that are perpendicular to its faces uh, up to passing to complementary angles, you, you get exactly a rational four-line configuration. Um, the only problem is that some four-line configurations do not give you non-degenerate tetrahedra. But for sure, if you can manage four-line configurations, you can ma ma manage the, the tetrahedra law. So to this end, we will first find all the six triples of angles given rise to the symmetric matrix written here, which is called the Graham determinant equation. So here, theta ij is the angle between two lines. This is not, uh, this is not a dihedral angle which will be pi minus theta ij, if you think about a tetrahedron, this is exactly an angle between some pair of lines. So now we have four lines, and we have six angles between those lines. And we know that because we have four lines, the Graham determinant has to vanish. This is a necessary condition. We can also write down this Gram determinant in polynomial variables. And so we will get a polynomial that is, let's say, that, that, that's going to be called the Gram polynomial. And now what remains is to solve this polynomial in the roots of unity. If we can do that, we definitely find all possible thetas ij that may produce either rational tetrahedra or rational line configurations. Sure, we, we have to mod out some non-geometric solutions from this set. But at least uh, this way we, we, we see where to begin. There are two methods of solving Laurent polynomials 
in the roots of unity. So if you, if you look at this expression, this determinant, it is a Lorentz polynomial in six variables. So one of the methods that we can employ is classifying vanishing sums of roots of unity. And those are known up to 12 roots. The other approach is uh, via commutative algebra. Um, and there we need to compute the so-called torsion closures of polynomial ideals. And this is a pretty different approach, actually. Now, these are the two main approaches that are known uh, for solving equations in the roots of unity, polynomial equations in the roots of unity. So the vanishing sums work like this. So you basically write down a sum of n variables, and then you pretend they are roots of unity, and you want to know when you get a zero. So for example, if n equals 6, you have the following classification of all possible solutions up to maybe some rotation. So for example, if, if the roots of unity cancel in pairs or if they cancel in triples, then you can rotate each pair and each triple by, uh, by any rational rotation. And so you will have actually families, parametric families of solutions. And there is one for the solution here that is not a parametric one. Uh, it, it's just a sum of six roots of unity. Well, you also can rotate all of them simultaneously, but th this will not give you free parameters. And this classification was brought up to n equals 12 by Rubinstein and Poonin maybe a decade ago. All right, so the torsion closures method is a different one. And it is based on the observation that if you, if you have a polynomial in two variables that you can solve in the roots of unity, then depending on the orders of those roots, you can also write down another polynomial which those x and y roots of unity solve. And there are several possibilities for that. So then you get a second algebraic curve and uh, you take the resultant of the first and the second one, so you intersect them, and uh, which fact requires a proof for sure. This way you will get a smaller curve. So you can, you can go down and the, the, the dimension of the corresponding ideal is gonna drop. And um, hopefully, it is going to drop significantly and, and then it will stabilize and, and then you will stabilize it some ideal just uh, because of the Noetherian property. And so the torsion closure in this way can be obtained in a finite number of steps. This method works well for two variables. For more variables, uh, you, you have to use basically an inductive approach and uh, reduce everything step by step for n equals 2. Uh, the problem is this uh, recursive approach becomes infeasible for more than four variables. Well, except for maybe some very trivial instances. So here we have this grand polynomial, which has 105 monomials, six variables, and really large symmetry group. So symmetries here are all index, per, index permutations and sign changes and um, also rational transformations uh, for the monomials. So the, the whole symmetry group has the order 23,040. So on one hand, we have a pretty big complication. This polynomial has 105 monomials and six variables. So 105 is way too bigger than 12. And even six variables are about two variables too many. So the trick here 
is to reduce this polynomial modular two, which reduction produces this small polynomial here. And this polynomial has 12 monomials and six variables too. So here, when you see those monomials, you really th have to think about the S4 orbit of each of the monomials, because over this orbit, we do summation and also each possible choice of signs. Here, the S4 orbit is pretty small. And even with a change of signs, we just have only 12 monomials and six variables still. Uh, by classifying vanishing sums of roots of unity, modular two, which is similar to what uh, Bjorn and Mike did some time ago, we can obtain all the solutions for this modular two reduced polynomial. And we get lucky here in a way because we obtain families of solutions with up to three variables. Not six anymore, just three. And then we can plug those into the initial polynomial and proceed to finding their torsion closures. So the main steps of the proof are like this. First, we start with a computation. I wouldn't say straightforward computation. It is not straightforward. And we find all solutions to the Gram determinant equation with small denominators. So they're all of the form pi times an integer over 420. This gives us a conjectural classification for sporadic instances. This is done by using C++ code. Um, and uh, after we are kind of sure that the solutions deliver, well, the, not the solutions, but the, the six tuples of angles that we found, deliver solutions to the Gram determinant equation, um, which is not trivial because you see if, if numerically you find something that is, looks like zero, how would you prove this is, this is exactly a zero? So this can be done also numerically because cyclotomic fields, basically we solve equations in cyclotomic fields, uh, have some, some sort of discreteness, but also we use sage mass to double check the obtained six tuples if they are indeed solutions by using algebraic numbers, arithmetic or, or over algebraic numbers. So the main, the main part in this step is to mod out all non-solutions, but it actually finds all solutions and, uh, and, and, and no rubbish attached to it. So then, by classifying all vanishing sums of up to 12 roots of unity and matching them with the 12 monomials in the mod to reduced gram polynomial, we solve that equation. And then we come back to the original gram polynomial. This is done by using sage math. After this step, we use this large symmetry group WD6, to reduce the number of equations down to some feasible amount. It's still in the hundreds, but uh, not in the thousands or dozens of thousands. So in the hundreds, we can use torsion closures and solve all those equations to find torsion closures of the corresponding ideals. This gives us all possible parametric solutions. And not only it finds some parametric solutions, it actually proves that we find all of them. So we have a complete classification here and it's algebraically certified. And this also confirms that all spreadic solutions have denominators up to 420. So the computation of this experimental or numerical computations that we did in the first step is actually correct. We do not have to search for solutions with bigger denominators. This is also done in sage mass. And for the parametric solutions, which are in this case, just uh, 
just algebraic curves, right? So, so al al algebraically parameterized sets, uh, which do not correspond to to real tetrahedra or line configurations, we use the geometry of convex polyhedra in order to convert algebraic solutions back into geometric solutions. And actually, for the tetrahedra, we get just one algebraic solution, which, however, converts into two geometric ones. For the line configurations, if I'm not mistaken, we have three algebraic solutions for four, four line configurations. And they convert into, well, they convert into a lot of parametric families. And as soon as we're done classifying four line configurations, we can attempt classifying n line configurations for n, five, six, and so on, by using the following fact. So an n-line configuration is actually realizable in R3, if and only if each of its uh, four-line sub-configurations is realizable. So we try to repeatedly enhance each of the four-line configurations we found and check if all the four-line configurations, or all the four-line four sub-configurations of this enhanced configuration belong to the known list. And this can be done by tree search, but this tree search happens to be quite extensive, especially when line configurations start growing. Um, so here, magma is used in, say, instead of sage mass because it basically allows for the same capability and it's faster. Somehow it's faster. Um, regretfully, it's not open source and it requires a license. So we check up to n equals 16 lines in order to make sure we, we have no rational line configurations with more than 15 lines, uh, apart from, from the perpendicular one. And at the end, we list only the maximal ones. So let me, let me show you again the list of, con of line configurations here. So you see. We start with the four line configurations, sporadic ones, and parametric ones. And then we try to kind of fit them together so that we get five, life, five line configurations. And then we check if we try to merge two line configurations together, each with four lines do we actually get uh, a, an, an appropriate five-line configurations, which is realizable and with rational angles. So we have to check all of its four lines sub-configurations, whether they are already on the list of what we've discovered. And uh, so we obtain already quite a bit of five-line configurations. Um, and we need to actually store not, not, not just the maximal ones, but all of them. Because the maximal ones are not, not enhanceable anymore. But uh, then you can enhance some four and five line configurations to maximal six line configurations. So we have to deal qu with quite a bit of possible branches of this tree. But still, in about 14 hours, magma can make it. And so the final step is to check that for n equals 16, uh, there are no rational line configurations. So we, we stop at 15 lines with the icosidotic gainer. OK. So thank you for attention. If you have any questions, please ask. Yeah, thank you. Questions, Finn, please. Oh, actually, I believe it is a amazing, uh, amazing work because 
Like it is an old problem, right? And um, uh, I have a question. I mm -hmm. was about uh, how you uh, you used as I as I remember, like you use this ra rationality, right? Only for this monomial, correct? Is it correct? How uh, you wh how you know this is a rational numbers or some any I don't know some uh, any subset of uh, of uh, of a circle right i mean like do it can you can you just to to to, uh, to use the same approach for other say algebraic numbers i don't know some subset of algebraic numbers uh, well I, you... I mean there are two approaches right one is about classifying vanishing sums yes which is really for for, for roots of unity only Ah, 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 ah. Yeah. The other one the is, it is yeah, I, I don't closures uh -huh. of polynomial ideals, and uh, th this is a bit different because, in in principle, you can you can use something like that not not only in, in cyclotomic fields, but we use it for cyclotomic fields only. Because exactly again, this observation that if, if you have two algebra, if if you have one algebraic curve, and um, it, it has some cyclotomic points on, on it, two roots of unity actually on it, then there is another different algebraic curve that also has those roots of unity on it, and so you can intersect them, and the dimension of the ideal drops. This also works for roots of unity. I mean, essentially, you, you, you really say, well, f, x and y are roots of unity, f of x, y equals zero. So by looking at the orders of x and y, for example, if x and y are both of odd order, then you can say, well, well but then uh, f of x squared and y squared has, has to be zero too. Yeah. Because of some, yeah, it seems to the evenness properties like that. Yeah, it is. Uh, you are lucky because it uh, everything you know. You just you, it seems to me it works only for rational, rational right numbers. Uh, I, I think it, you can. Well, this this torsion closure thing you, you can um, you can use uh, for way general objects, but. That that that's something I'm not an expert in. I mean, I can understand roots of unity. Kiran can understand more. He is he is an expert. Instead of instead of for roots of unity, maybe some solution of algebraic equation, theoretically is possible, and more general. Okay. Anyway, you know, this yeah, it's, it's, I, it's, be, I believe it is uh, good enough. You know, if you even solve this problem. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for us, for us, it's enough. Yeah, for us, it's enough. <laughs> but uh, also, sometimes, if even if you have a parametric family of, of tetrahedra, yeah. and you want to know something like, oh, all right, so let me let me be this angle a parameter and this angle a parameter, and two other angles I'm, I'm going to fix, and I just want them to be rational. What are the possible solutions? So then you have to find a torsion closure in a functional field. And this algorithm can also make it work. Mm -hmm. So it, okay. it can handle this parameter separately. As, as, as really as an element of some functional field. Find this torsion closure in other variables. So it, 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 is, it is pretty, Pretty universal in this, in this sense. And, and the torsion closure is the, the method, or it is the object. So how it? Uh, it is an object. The torsion closure is an object. And it is defined uh, uh, by the ideal generated by the polynomial f of x y, right? Uh, well, yeah. In in this case, you you can adopt this definition. You can you can say that if f f of x y has a solution in the roots of unity then, well, I just do this process of uh, finding yet another curve of one of those forms listed, 
like f of negative x, y, f of x, negative y, and so on. Writing it down, so now I have terms, taking the resultant, and thus intersecting them, and so then I go down in the dimension of, of the ideal. Yeah, it may be I'm thinking, maybe to use some cubic uh, cubics, because if you look at cubics, they also some uh, they, they also set, uh, have some some algebraic properties. Like maybe it, it you can do something instead of roots of unity. I oh, actually I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, congratulations! It's, uh, it's very good, very good job. Uh, more questions? One question. Can you go back to your list of sporadic uh, solutions near the start? Yes. So all the, so all of your ends, right, are divisors of, you know, like 120, five factorial, except for this, oh, yeah, 20, yeah. this 21. Yes. Right? And then also all of these, you have one blue one, right? Which has been dis which had been discovered already. Yes. Do you know why sort of twenty one never appeared, or why twenty? You know, right? It's not a divisor of like it doesn't look like the rest of them. Is the question? <laughs> uh, right. The, 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 this thing doesn't look like the rest of them. Uh, if you if you if you look at it, you you also notice that um, all three guys. They are, uh, they are different from others in this respect. So not only they are geometrically different, well, in a, each of them is just representative of an S4 symmetry orbit, right? So up, to, up to geometric symmetries. But they are different from others also up to this um, Regi symmetry. Up to this Regi involution. So, for, for for example, many other entries, many other entries. For well, here, uh, one of the entries for denominator thirty is geometrically different from the entries with denominator sixty, right below. So, this blue six, twelve, ten, fifteen, ten, twenty is different from one of of the Okay. Of the denominator 60 is 60 pulls below, but they all sit in the same Regi orbit, while the 21 ones sit in a in, really in a separate Regi orbit. So this is why probably people didn't didn't find them or didn't didn't pay attention somehow. Uh, I, I don't know really what the reason was, uh, but even more interestingly, here the two parametric families one was known since 1980 sorry 1895 1895 it was discovered by hill and the other family is apparently new and it comes via this regis symmetry again so maybe somehow people just overlooked this regis symmetry and, and this is why this 21 never came up but also well Maybe maybe nobody just searched for them. I, I don't know. But somehow it's not not a very big denominator, so it's easy to make computer search up to denominator twenty one. Okay, thank you. And one more question: the when you did your computational stuff, you had like your four steps, and the one step to find all. So yeah, yeah, starting. Uh, yeah, so for the computational step, you said you had to sort of check numerically that you actually had a zero solution. You said you had to check that things were actually not numer or numerically correct, right? Uh, yes, so the, the point is when you have this gram matrix and you put in the entries and yeah. then uh, you compute the, the denominator, uh, well, also you have to check that uh, this matrix is positive semi-definite, right? Um, but but there, at least you have inequalities, and right. here you have inequality, and you get some number that is 
that is awfully close to zero, but how do you know that it is actually zero? Correct, correct. So then you, okay, so then you double check that. And once you have that, the remaining steps, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Is that correct? Well, you don't want to, uh, you, you, you don't have to worry about uh, whether the spreading solutions that you find are fake or not. They okay. are correct. Okay. But uh, then um, a very hard job is, is to prove that the parametric solutions that we find are actually the only ones. Uh, that requires all, all this business with uh, both roots of unity vanishing sums of roots of unity and torsion closures, um, which uh, I, I think the first comes from, well, probably comes from quite ancient times, like from classical times, but it was definitely employed by Conway and Jones, who wrote a paper about solving De Fontaine. Uh, trigonometric equations. Um, and the other one with, uh, uh, with torsion closures, it has never been uh, applied to geometry before, I think. Well, at least not, not in this sense, not to like classical geometry, algebraic geometry for sure, but not classical Euclidean geometry. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Any more questions? What is uh, what is here D six? Uh, and what is here D six? Uh, you use uh, the symmetry group. Uh, can you please repeat it? I because I didn't hear. You can ask in Russian the question. If you want, you can ask in many languages, but I, I, uh, I hear is what is here D6? Oh, D6. Ah, this ah, is this root lattice. Ah, it's a root, root system D6. Yeah, oh, that's not, sorry, not ah, okay. Root, yeah, <laughs> this is a D6 root system, and WD6 is, uh, is, is, is exactly as the well, well group of the D6 uh, root system. Yeah, so you 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 have all all those friends here, right? And I mean, even even uh, S four is uh, actually a group of A three, right? Now. <laughs> so you have you have W of A three, but this is not big enough. Then then we need yeah, W. So and there is oh there, there is also this B uh, three. So you have. A3, you have B3, and you have the D D6 root system, and it's fail group, WD6. And that WD40 makes proofs even more, even smoother. And it is the biggest uh, finite group in which sense among uh, all say, finite groups? No, well, I mean, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> well, I mean, acting somewhere or... Can it be bigger, right? You know, WD40, you use it as a spray for lubrication for a bicycle or something. Ah, oh, I see, okay. Yeah. This, is, this is why it makes, makes proofs really smooth. Uh, but that, that WD6 is not the biggest finite group ever. It's just the biggest finite group that we deal with. Ah, the T, okay, that do you use, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we, we have to use it exactly because um, because this polynomial here, the gram polynomial has this symmetry. Yes. So it has, it has a lot of symmetries, some of which are uh, somehow explained by, um, by geometry and some are explained by register symmetries. So you can, yeah. can you, can you interrupt just a second? You, you can continue because you have now break up to, uh, up, yeah. 20 minutes only, right? We have up to 6.30 in Moscow time. You can continue, but, uh, but as, uh, however, like, let, let us consider that as a, some informal, informal uh, discussion, okay? 
because of already it is not fair because as for other uh, for other participants we give only uh, uh, speakers we give only five minutes right 